All right. So thank you everyone for joining us this morning. My name is Rebecca Antill. I'm the Youth Services Consultant at the South Carolina State Library. And today we are going to be talking about um, how to deliver and present uh, Every Child Ready to Read workshops for daycare providers and other early childhood educators. We have with us Dr. Betsy Diamond Cohen. Um, just a little bit of housekeeping before I turn it over to her. Um, the session is being recorded. Um, this is our second of these sessions. And so we're going to take the, the best of the recordings and they'll be placed on our Niche Academy platform along with the slides and the handouts. So you'll be able to access those um, later next month. And if you need closed captioning, um, that, Let's see, that should be at one of our available options. Um, we are also going to use the annotate feature um, later on, as well as the breakout rooms. And we will walk you through um, how to do each of those as we get there. And I think that's it. Betsy, it's all yours. All right. Good morning, everybody. Glad to see you here. I'm Betsy D.M.I. Cohen, a children's librarian with a master's in library and information science and a doctorate in communications design. As a children's librarian, I've worked in public libraries as well as children's museums, both here and abroad. And I've also been a home child care provider and a preschool teacher. Plus, I'm the mother of three grown children, and I now have my very first grandchild. Yay! <laughs> I know the best way to learn is through play, and I hope to practice what I preach. So I hope that you'll find this webinar fun as well as helpful. As librarians, one of our main job is to help children build early literacy skills. Studies have shown that children's brains develop the most in the first three years of life, and the skills that they develop in the first five years have an extraordinary influence on their success as adults. There's a nationwide push for libraries to use every child ready to read to become involved in a new initiative also called Ready to Read. Every state is supposed to be spreading the early literacy message far and wide, and many states are sharing information with each other. So our objectives for today, since child care providers spend so much time with young children, one of the areas that Ready to Read, a follow-up from Every Child Ready to Read, has chosen to focus on is workshops for child care providers. This is a relatively new area for children's librarians, and that's why I'm presenting this workshop to you today. So my objectives are to help you be familiar with the world of child care providers, because it's different from the typical librarians giving workshops to other librarians, to be aware of the pre-designed but adaptable Every Child Ready to Read um, manual, the Ready to Read Early Literacy Workshops that are already available and another resource, and to consider using some new engagement strategies and techniques for addressing child care providers as a group. My ultimate goal today is to help you feel comfortable facilitating workshops for child care providers. After the workshop is over, Rebecca will send you a handout which has everything that is on these slides. I don't want you to take notes now because I'd rather have you participate fully, pay attention, and be involved in what we're doing. Since the notes will be supplied for you, all you have to do is listen in and enjoy the fun. There are a few guidelines for our time today. I'd like this to be a community where we can learn and connect with each other and a safe space where confidentiality is respected and an interruption free zone where cell phones are put on vibrate. If you need to take a call, that's fine, but go out and mute yourself and then come back when you're talking. Um, now, everyone give a thumbs up if you can abide by these guidelines. Great. Now, I probably didn't need to tell you those, but when presenting a workshop to a new audience, such as child care providers, giving guidelines just like those is helpful for putting them at ease and making them feel safe. So I just wanted to model it for you. I, I, I actually didn't think I needed to say that. <laughs> okay, um, to start out, can you please share with us what is your name and then something you love about being a children's librarian and then call on someone else in the webinar. So um, let me uh, pause the share for a minute so you can see everyone's faces bigger. I'm Betsy. 
I love being a children's librarian because I love to sing and this gives me the opportunity to sing as part of my job. Okay, Rebecca, your turn. Um, hi, um, my name is Ego by Becca. I'm not currently a children's librarian, but I am the education and program coordinator at an art museum in ah. Charleston, South Carolina. And I'm currently enrolled as a student at the USC School of Library and Information Science and taking the children's um, and young adult programming class, which I love. So I do love working with kids, um, but this is my first foray into librarianship. Well, welcome. I used to work at, um, I worked at two different museums and I love the combination of museums and libraries. I think it's a natural fit. So mm -hmm. cool. Yeah. Um, so how about Caitlin? Good morning. Good morning. Um, I'm Caitlin Bellinger from Lawrence County. Um, and what do I love? What don't I love about being a children's librarian? <laughs> um, I, I think probably my favorite thing is when kids get really excited about books um and and their parent like especially okay graphic novels parents might be on the fence about whether or not to let their kids read a graphic novel but then i can convince them that graphic novels are books um and the kids just get so excited and then eventually they make their way to other novels but then their parents are like wow i'm really glad i let them read graphic novels that's my favorite thing is being able to change perspectives about what counts as reading so that's great thanks caitlin now you get to choose someone else i'm going to choose the other rebecca all right thank you caitlin um my name is Rebecca. I work at the State Library and I love I love being a children's librarian because I get to work with all of you guys and gals. And I choose Anne. Even if you don't have a camera, it would be great if you could unmute yourself and then tell us what you love about being a children's librarian. Uh, no microphone. Do you want to write it in the chat? And um, maybe while you're writing in the chat, Rebecca can call on someone else. Let's see. Um, Karen. Hi, I'm Karen. I'm with the Greenville County Library System. Um, I used to love seeing the kids and the families, and I don't really work directly with them anymore, but I love the variety of it, and I love my staff and how creative they are. Great. Thank you. Do you want to try calling on someone else and we'll see if we're able to hear from them? Let's see. Um, Shannon. Hi, I'm Shannon Duffy. I'm from the Berkeley County Library System. I um, work I'm a young adult librarian, but I do do a lot of children's services and a weekly story time. And I, I love story time. It's like the best part of my week. Um, obviously, when it was live, it was much more gratifying than um, uh, Facebook. <laughs> but uh, I love the literature. I love the pictures. I love the children's reactions to it. I love telling the stories from it. So I do, I do love that aspect of it for sure. And I'll pick, is that it? Alexandra's? Is that correct? Oh, okay. So I see Alexandra's wrote on um, the chat and so did Anne. Oh, okay. Sorry. So um, let's hear from Emily. And then we can um, we can read out loud what's on the chat. Oh, sorry, guys. I had video. Oh. <laughs> I'm so used to not. I had pulled out the laptop. But anyway, uh, <laughs> let me mute. 
Okay, so Anne said, I love seeing kids get excited when you show them the resources that they can really enjoy. And Alexandra said, hi, I don't have a mic or cam on my computer, but I'm Alex. I work with Spartanburg County Public Library at Middle Tiger Branch. I am an inspiring children's librarian. I just began working as a children's assistant about two weeks ago, and I love it. Yay! Thank you, Anne, and thank you, on Alex, for sharing. Um, have we heard from Emily? And Emily, if you would like to share, if you don't have a microphone, feel free to write it in the chat. And I guess that's everybody, right? I think so. Oh, there we go. My name is Emily Stowell. I work at the Charleston County Public Library. I love that with children, you know exactly how well you're doing. That is absolutely true. The good, the bad, you know exactly if you've performed well. Yep. Well, I love all of your comments and I agree with them all. But today we're gonna to talk about something that wasn't on anybody's list of favorite activities as a children's librarian. And that is giving instructional presentations to adults. Even though we might not be comfortable doing this yet, research has shown how important the earliest years are and what a huge impact caregivers have upon children from birth to age three. It takes a village and we have to work together. So you've all heard about Every Child Ready to Read. Well, when Every Child Ready to Read first came out, um, it was the Association of Library Services for Children who got together with the Public Library Association and they said early literacy is so important and librarians aren't really aware of it. So let's see what we can do to make them aware. And they created this curriculum that had research, summaries of research of why early literacy was so important what early literacy was, and then they had PowerPoint presentations with notes that librarians could give to parents and to childcare providers. And every, and they had six practices that they talked about, no, six, six skills for early literacy, including narrative skills and phonological awareness. And all the librarians were supposed to be doing these things. After a couple of years, the researchers who put it together went around the country to see how it was doing. And they found out that although librarians were excited about it, not a lot of them were actually doing these PowerPoint presentations. Why? because they didn't sign up to become adult um, continuing education people. They really were comfortable working with kids, but they weren't so comfortable working with adults. And one person told me who lived in a rural setting, I grew up with everybody here. If I'm gonna to talk to them about phonological awareness and narrative skills, they're gonna look at me and say, who do you think you are? So the researchers put everything on hold, they went back and then they revised Every Child Ready to Read. They left in the information that was already there, but instead they added in the five practices. And basically it simplified things. It said there are just five things you need to know in order to help your child learn how to read when they enter school to make it easier. And that is to talk, to sing, to read and write and play. And that is the version of Every Child Ready to Read that we use now. So. The Association of Library Services for Children hosts a list of competencies for librarians serving children in libraries, and it's revised every few years. The latest revision was in 2020, and one of the competencies is establishing programs and services for caregivers, child care providers, educators, and other community professionals who work with children, families, and caregivers. So now it's official. But they don't really teach that in library school, and it's not something that we consciously think about when we become children's librarians. So that's why Rebecca asked me if I could do this workshop for you, because I'm hoping this workshop will make giving workshops much easier for you. It'll actually be fun, and you're all going to be great at it. So to start out, I'd like you to write in the chat if you've worked with child care providers before. Have they come to your programs, or have you gone to their sites? Have you visited their sites maybe to promote summer reading? And if you've had any other kind of experience with childcare providers, please write it down here. And at the same time, I'd like to know what you know about childcare providers. So in your, on your screen, you should have an options button. It's either at the top or the bottom of your screen. 
And if you click on view options and then you click on annotate, there's actually some letters. And if you click on the letters, that will help you write and you can actually write on this screen. So I'd like you to write what you know about childcare providers, either from personal interactions with them or something that you've um, heard about them or read about them. Betsy, we are still on the what do you love about being a children's librarian screen. Oh, that's it. Oh, because I paused my share. Okay, thank you. Uh, resume share. Ah, there we go. Okay, so in the full screen, if you if you move your mouse around and you go up to the top where it says you're viewing Betsy's screen and view options, click on that and choose annotate. And it will give you a, a menu of options to write on the screen. Oh, there we go. We've got a couple of people. And I see we have a wide variety of answers too. Some people say they've um, just uh, casual conversations. Someone works with a lot of child care centers. Someone else hasn't worked with them before. We have someone who was a nanny for two years. And that is also, I believe, considered child care because often the nanny is the one who brings the child to the programs at the library. Um, and then we have someone else who went to small daycares um, and even had special story times for the daycare providers. That's great. You have the option to either draw or you can choose the text option up there in the annotate box. So let's see, they're very busy, absolutely, <laughs> and very yeah. diverse. Mm -hmm. Ooh, that's great. And it takes a while to show up, so we'll wait just a minute. Juggling many different hats and oh. kids, yep. Similar to our school librarians that we work with. Yep. Want the best for their kids, but don't always want to keep up with academic jargon, newest research. Yep. Many different age groups. In the before times, I delivered bags of books to the daycares on a monthly basis. I was able to talk with them and promote library programs. Yeah, that's a wonderful service that a lot of libraries offer for the child care providers is putting together these uh, boxes of books, sometimes even kits on a theme that they can loan out on a monthly basis. That's great. Mm -hmm. It's a great way to start that relationship. And their relationships with the children they serve uh, can vary widely and looking to see what the library has for their classes. Yeah, some of them are savvy and they know that the library can be a great place for them. And some have no idea that the library is a resource that they can use. Uh, did I miss anything? Not always well versed in child development theory. Aha. Uh -huh. Okay, you're right. Just Let's where we go. come in. Yeah. Okay. Oh, now let me. Uh, let me clear off the screen and let me also move to, oh, I have to stop annotating. <laughs> there we go. Okay, so now we're gonna take a poll. Do, child care providers need to be licensed in the state of South Carolina? Give a thumbs up or a thumbs down. Type yes or no in the chat. And we've got two yeses in the chat. Okay. Oh, and a no. Oh, I see, we're do, using annotate. No, if it's a relative and no, not all of them. Okay, you guys are good. Um, the answer is childcare providers do not need to be licensed in South Carolina. Some of them do, but not all of them. 
So the um, faith-based providers, the child care centers, the group of child care homes, and approved providers in South Carolina must be licensed, and they're licensed by the Department of Social Services, the Division of Child Care Service. But the child care providers that do not need to be licensed are uh, people who are providing care in the child's home or are relatives of the children who they're taking care of. When the care is provided in a provider's home for one or more children of the same family, even if that family is unrelated to the provider. And any program for preschool and kindergarten children that operates fewer than four hours or a week, four hours a day or fewer than two days a week, summer camps and Bible schools. Okay, so let's go to the next one. And our next question is. Do child care providers need professional development credits, CEUs? Okay, I see three no's, four no's, five no's. Oh, I guess. Six, I guess. <laughs> Someone else said, I'm not sure. Okay, the answer is some do and some don't. In the licensed child care centers, the staff must have 15 hours of professional development annually with at least five hours in child growth and development and five hours in curriculum activities for children in order to keep their license. And when you're talking about early literacy, that could go under either of those categories. Curriculum, curriculum activities, which is the things that we do, the finger plays in the books, or child growth and development, which is the importance of early literacy. Um, oh, yes, Emily asked a good question in the chat. She's, she asks if those are required annually. Yes, they are. But unlicensed providers do not need any credits. So if you're trying to offer a workshop, it might be harder to get them to attend your workshops, even though since they're not obligated um, to be licensed, they may be the ones who are the most in need of having that background. Okay, here's your last question. Are child care providers required to have a background in early childhood education? Oh, and Rebecca said it's easy to get a waiver on those credit requirements. I did not know that. Hmm. No, no, not necessarily. It depends again if they're, yes, it depends if they're commercial providers or family. So Becca, you're right. In licensed child care centers, they must have one of the following. The, for the main teacher, six hours of training in child growth and development and family childhood education, or be under direct supervision and have a bachelor's degree in a child related area. Their assistant only needs a high school diploma and six months of experience and must be able to read and write. Uh, in group child care homes, all of the caregivers must have six hours of training in child growth and development and early childhood education. Any caregiver with a bachelor's degree in a related child development field may be getting work immediately, even without supervision. But in the non-licensed setting, such as the family child care homes, no pre-service or ongoing training is, is required. The provider must be at least 18 years old and must live in the home, and that is the only requirement. Their assistant must be at least 14 years old, and all staff under 18 years old must be supervised and they all must be able to read and write. Why is this relevant to us? Because we can encourage licensed workers to attend our workshops for professional development credit. And if you're interested in doing something like that, talk to Rebecca because she can tell you about the, what you need to do in order to be able to give those credits. But how can we bring the childcare providers who don't need our credits to our workshops? We don't need to ensure that they, ha oh, oh. Um, we can make them, bring them to our workshops by being relevant and fun. And this might be a wonderful target audience for our workshops. They may not have access to good books or know how to present circle times. Maybe instead of bringing them together with the people from the big centers where they might feel intimidated, we can reach out to folks who have the least amount of formal training. Head Start teachers already know about early literacy because it's built into their structure. Since family daycares do not 
have that requirement and may be operating alone without supports, they may, may be a great niche audience for our workshops. And I see someone ask, just as a mom, um, how can you ensure that your child care provider has a li license? Uh, you can ask to see it, but there's also in South Carolina something called ABC. And um, if you go online and just do just do a Google search for child care provider South Carolina, it will give you links to different organizations. And I believe there's one that gives you uh, answers to that question. Rebecca, do you have anything to add to that? Oh. So there are a couple, you're welcome. <laughs> There are some important factors to consider when planning workshops for early childhood educators to ensure that they are indeed a valuable investment of time. Child care providers often work long hours from Monday to Friday, so the best time to hold a workshop is either in the evenings when they're tired, so if they yawn, don't take it personally, uh, on the weekends, but then they're giving up a beautiful sunny Saturday afternoon for you, or maybe nap time. So the best time, best way to plan your workshop is to talk to the child care providers ahead of time and find out what would be most convenient for them. Make sure to start and end on time. Since they have these long work hours, their time off is especially precious. And since they don't get work time for coming to uh, these kinds of workshops, uh, be considerate of their time. If you're able to give course credits, mention that, and that will help you get buy-in from the beginning. And remember, the child care providers can have children from birth all the way up to five years old. So if you're going to be mentioning or promoting certain activities in your workshop, make sure that ahead of time you know the ages that are being served by the people attending and that you can present optional ways to adapt your workshops to fit those ages that the caregivers are taking care of. Some early childhood educators may have expertise in fields that we know little about, and yet others may know less about early literacy than we do. Some may be new at the job and unfamiliar with circle time and story time. And on the other hand, some educators may have master's degrees in early childhood education, and they may know even more than we do about presenting story time programs. So we have to keep that in mind. Our libraries serve a variety of these providers. And so number one, don't make assumptions about level of knowledge. It's clear there is no kind of standard educational level. And because of the varied backgrounds, our workshops aim to build upon the knowledge while honoring the expertise of those childcare providers who've taken the time and the effort to learn more about early literacy. Even if someone doesn't know a lot about early literacy, they may have wonderful experience and knowledge about kids just from having run a childcare for years. So what we can do is we can ask for their opinion and engage them in conversations instead of just telling them a lot of facts. And without making people who don't have the background knowledge feel left out, then we have a much more comfortable atmosphere and we can learn a lot more. So while we can't take the background knowledge in early literacy for granted, we have to be very careful to present it in joyful, engaging, and non-judgmental ways so that everyone is engaged and feels that our workshops are worthwhile. So child care providers are people who take care of children from birth to five. A very broad range of people, and the early child care providers include this wide variety of people. However, we deal with kids and they deal with kids but the roles we play are very different. And so before you begin a workshop with childcare providers, you need to be able to communicate who you are and what you do. And so we also have to think about the expertise that we offer. Now, one thing is that I, my expertise, having been a children's librarian for so many years, is I have a great wealth of finger plays. And one of my favorite finger plays is called Alligator, Alligator. Whenever I do preschool story time, I start with Alligator, Alligator, and I end with it. So I'm going to just show it to you now. So everyone, I'm going to uh, stop sharing for now so you can see me. Put your hands like this and make an alligator. And this alligator is very hungry. So he's going to open his mouth and close it like this. Open and close, open and close. He's going to look for something to eat. And what does he see? He's very hungry. He sees a frog sitting on a log. Yum, yum. 
Now put one hand out here and one hand up here and go down while you hit your hand. Let's try it again. Go down. Good. One last time. Go down. And so the alligator jumps and he hits the log, but the frog is jumped off and the log goes around and around like this. And does the alligator get the frog? Mm -mm. The frog swims away. Now there are words that go along with this. So I'm going to say the words and I want you to do the motions. Alligator, alligator sitting on a log. Down in the water, he sees a frog. Down goes the alligator, around goes the log. Away swims the frog. Let's try it again. Alligator, alligator sitting on a log. Down in the water, he sees a frog. Down goes the alligator, around goes the log. Away swims the frog. And say it with me. Alligator, alligator sitting on a log. Down in the water, he sees a frog. Down goes the alligator, around goes the log. Away swims the frog. In a deep voice, alligator, alligator sitting on a log. Down in the water, he sees a frog. Down goes the alligator, around goes the log. Away swims the frog. In a high voice. In a soft voice, alligator, alligator sitting on a log. Down in the water, he sees a frog. Down goes the alligator, around goes the log. Away swims the frog. In a loud voice, alligator, alligator sitting on a log. Down in the water, he sees a frog. Down goes the alligator, around goes the log. Away swims the frog in a normal voice. Alligator, alligator sitting on a log. Down in the water, he sees a frog. Down goes the alligator, around goes the log. Away swims the frog. Good job. So why did I do that rhyme? Because, there we go. Um, I like that because it shows that ritual is a great way to start and to end things. And alligator, alligator is a little bit difficult because it has that syncopation in it, right? It doesn't quite flow. And when you hear it the first time, it's a little bit confusing. And I know that the best way to learn is by repetition. So if I repeat it over and over, you're going to eventually learn it. But if I repeat it and over and over, it'll get really boring. So I use a technique of presenting it in different ways. We did it two or three times regular, but then we went into the low voice and the high voice and the soft voice and the loud voice. And then we did it normally again. So by the time we're done, you've done it eight times. And now you really know it. You don't even need these words. And that's a great technique for teaching childcare providers how they can introduce something new by repeating it, but by repeating it in different ways. So that's one example. There are lots of differences between librarians and early childhood educators. We directly interact with children in limited time periods, maybe 15 minutes to an hour for a program. Childcare providers can be with children from four to eight hours every single day, five or five or six days a week. When we librarians finish our programs, we can retreat into our offices and go back to desk duty. Childcare providers don't have that luxury. Parents drop their children off and rarely stay. Without parents on site, the early childhood educators are responsible for children during the busy times and during the quiet times. They are with the children from the moment they're dropped off in the morning until they're picked up, sometimes at the very end of the day. They have them for nap time, meal time, diaper change time, and more. Sometimes the caregivers spend even more time with children than their parents do. So this means that the relationship between the caregivers and the children is of utmost importance. And the environment the child care provider creates for the children is really important too. While there's usually unstructured time during the day, which can be planned ahead, which is similar to our library programs, there's a lot more of unstructured time with free play. 
transitions from moving from one activity to another occur on a regular basis because even if you have free play then you have lunch and you have nap time then you have more free play then you have circle time and these transitions are notoriously difficult for children some routines don't vary from day to day you usually have lunch time at the same time nap time at the same time if relevant playground time etc but some of the activities we use in our programs like alligator alligator can be adapted for caregivers as transition helpers so instead of just using a finger play or a song as a filler between books and a story time or at the beginning of story time, it can be a standalone activity to get children's activity, to get them to focus, to get them to participate in you, to get them to stop what they were doing before so that that way they can smoothly move from one activity to another. So if a child care provider were to say to everyone, OK, everyone, let's do alligator alligator and it's free play time so they're all involved in an activity instead of saying stop your activity and come together for circle time they stop for fun to do alligator alligator and now they're all attentive to the child care provider and they can say okay come on up we're doing circle time now so a story or song or finger play really helps with these transitions since the child care providers need to be with the children again it's rare for these tips that we can give them to take place during their day. And that's why uh, we are now creating workshops for them just to help make their job easier by imparting what we know that we can share with them. Now, most child, most uh, child care providers have a circle time and their circle time is at least once a day and it lasts for a minimum of 15 minutes. This is the formal learning part of their day and it can be compared with story time. There are different practices that we want to introduce to child care providers, um, but they and we use every child ready to read as our basis. They use something called the Palomito Basics, and they're probably unaware of our five practices of talking, read, write, and play. So to hear more about the Palomito Basics, I have another webinar tomorrow. But in the meantime, for the five practices, there's a song that we can sing about them. And I'd like you to sing this song with me. It, here are the five practices. And the song goes like this. Talk, sing, read, write, play. 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 Hooray. But just yesterday, I was singing that song with another children's librarian. And instead of saying hooray at the end, she said every day. So why don't you sing it with me? And let's try it with every day. Here we go. Talk sing read write play 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 every day okay so when we're talking to kids we're building up their vocabulary and we're also reciting rhymes with them we're having conversations with them we're listening to what they have to say and responding back which is also teaching them about communication when we sing with them, we're introducing new words, which builds their vocabulary. It also breaks the words into syllables, which is phonological awareness. And when children start to learn to read, they sound out the words. So being able to hear the sounds in words and in between words is a wonderful jump start for learning how to read. Here, when we're talking about kids under the age of five, reading does not necessarily mean, certainly doesn't mean them reading, and it's not necessarily us reading to them, it means sharing books in joyful ways. So it can be just looking at the pictures in a book and talking about the illustrations, it can be singing a song about them, it can be holding up the book cover and just saying something about the book or playing a game associated with the book, anything that builds positive feelings about books. And writing also. We know a, a one-year-old can't write, um, although they might be able to scribble, but doing finger plays exercises the muscles, those fine motor skills that are later on being used for writing. So when we say writing, we mean using your muscles and getting them ready to write. And play is the way children learn. Children learn best by doing it themselves and discovering by themselves. So the more playful we can make these experiences, the better knowledge they'll have to start them off and the more interested they will be in learning how to read. What is early literacy? Early literacy is what children know about communication, about language, verbal and nonverbal, reading and writing before they can actually read and write. These early literacy skills are built every time children experience conversations, stories, and books. 
Anytime they hear people talking or they see words in print, even street signs and cereal boxes, their literacy skills are being strengthened. Children learn these skills beginning from infancy, and they're getting to, ready to read long before they even start school. So early literacy is not the teaching of reading, it's laying the foundation for reading. And vocabulary is a large part of early literacy skills. So by now we have lots of research on early literacy and studies have shown that the number of child, words children know when they enter kindergarten is very important for their future. Vocabulary sight is an important factor in helping children be ready to read. And studies have shown that children who hear fewer words by age three are less prepared to learn to read by the time they enter kindergarten. And I look at it like two escalators. So if this is the amount of words a child knows when they enter kindergarten, this one knows this many words and this one knows this many words, the words that they know increase like this. So by the time they're in third grade, the child who ended up, who started kindergarten knowing more words knows exponentially more words than the child who knew less when they started. And their learning takes, moves at a much slower rate. So entering kindergarten being ready to read has a direct connection with being able to read well by third grade. And now more studies have shown that being able to read proficiently in third grade enables students to use reading in order to learn. But if they can't read well, they have more difficulty understanding the complicated subjects that are being introduced to them in third grade. So proven connections between literacy skills in third grade result in better outcomes. And these have been shown to be graduate likelihood of graduating from high school, holding a job for longer periods of time, earning higher wages, having more success at long-term relationships, and even lower rates of being in prison. Um, there have been studies by James Heckman, who's a Nobel Prize winning economist, who says that there's a great rate of return to society, something like for every $1 we spend on early literacy, we're saving six to $7 of benefits for incarceration and all the other needs that will have to be met. So entering school ready to learn leads to better education, better health, social and economic outcomes. Not only that, but these benefits can be passed on through generations. And that's what the latest research by James Heckman shows. So the more words children know in kindergarten, the easier it is for them to learn in general. And how do children learn words? Not by flashcards, by hearing them and singing songs, by being parts of conversations that use new words and by hearing them and using them in relation to fun books. All of these are part of every child ready to read which guides the practices of children's librarians. Now, I just wanna show you three different resources that are available to you. And these are my three favorite resources for dealing with childcare providers. In addition to the Every Child Ready to Read manual that was designed for librarians, the Association of Library Services for Children has also created a toolkit for serving early childhood educators. In it, there are ready-made PowerPoints which you can use or modify. There is a PDF with a note section that suggests points to make, but the actual PowerPoint has many blank note pages so you can write in exactly what you want to say in your own words. I'm going to show you quickly um, what it looks like and Rebecca has a copy of this in her office, which she would be happy to lend to you. So here's the toolkit and as we go down, you know, it gives you lots of background information. But then it has these PDFs that show you what the slide looks like. And then it actually gives you what points to make and notes about what you can do. Then another resource is this one. And Rebecca has sent to everyone attending this webinar a link to the Ready Read Michigan toolkit that I developed. And that will also be put in the chat. This toolkit is also based on the five Every Child Ready to Read practices, and it includes two PowerPoint presentations that can be used to give workshops to child care providers. One is called Growing Early Literacy Skills Through Songs and Rhymes, and the other is Growing Early Literacy Skills Through Books. And while it also has other materials that were developed for family early literacy workshops, each child care provider workshop comes with an agenda, a list of supplies, a list of things to do ahead of time to be ready on the day of the workshop, preparation guidelines and instructions, oops, sorry, 
and instructions for set no okay instructions for setting up the workshop i had a link there that somehow doesn't seem to be working okay um so i'll just go to the try one more no nope. okay um and i will show you a slide about that later on then the Atlanta Speech School is a brain research-backed comprehensive language and literacy school providing educational as well as clinical programs. In addition, Atlanta Speech School's Roland Center for Language and Literacy provides professional development for teachers and educators in partner schools and preschools. They also have an online presence called the Cox Campus and it is wonderful. The Cox Campus is a free learning portal designed to distill the science of reading into simple actions adults can take when interacting with children. The Cox Campus is free, has free and interactive courses with engaging comprehensive tools that translate language and literacy research into simple, effective, and immediate applicable practices. So here's an example of their professional development courses. And if you're looking for clips to put into your workshop for child care providers, they have some really short clips that are just absolutely wonderful. They also have downloadable developmental tips, templates, story guides, a rhyme and activity collection and more. And here's a video that's produced by the Cox campus that I love. And um, I think it's great to help parents and caregivers recognize and embrace opportunities for building early literacy skills. So let's have a look and see the video. Oh, whoops, hold on. Did I forget to share my sound? Yes. Okay. Here we go. You see it, right? Hey, Mr. Kill. Did you see that? Why would somebody do that? Please go into the classroom, no talking, quietly. Hey, Ms. Merida, how you doing? We need you inside. How do you think that makes us feel? I forgot my number. What's your name? Jordan. What's your last name? Carter. All right. Go ahead. School is hard enough. Come on in, sit down quietly at your desk and begin writing. This kind of stuff just makes it harder. I said quietly, please. Who's talking? Is it you, Sophie? Don't let it be you. Don't believe me? Sophie. Please just watch. I'm not up here for me. I'm up here for you. Pay attention. Okay? Now somebody answer me. Somebody needs to answer me really fast. Every time we're ignored or yelled at or silent, the teacher takes away what's possible. No horseplay, no running, and especially no talking. Moment Kids by are... moment. Ms. Garrity. Your student's behavior yesterday in the lunchroom, it was terrible. Next time, silent lunch. Did you hear that? Stay in line and catch a bubble. I'm not playing. If this is education, we're in trouble. Bye, Miss McGarrity. Frederick Douglass said, once you learn to read, you'll be forever free. The way it is now, two of the three of us will never be able to really read. It doesn't have to be this way. Hey, Jordan. How you doing? Good. Good. Everyone we meet throughout our day can make a difference. I've been waiting for you to arrive. All the difference. Good. How are you? Good. How are you? Hi. Hi, Jordan. Good morning, Jordan. How are you? I'm doing well. Thanks for asking. How are you? Good. Go ahead and put your number in. Talk with oh, us, not at us. That's OK. I'll look it up for you. Go ahead, sweetheart. OK. All right. Have a Teach good us day. what we need to know. Good morning, That's how we get smarter. Well, good morning, Sophie, Janicia, and Jordan. And when you talk with us and teach us, give us bigger and bigger words. Now what I'd like you to do, children, is turn around and converse with your neighbor and discuss where the mother might have gone. Words that we can use to read and understand. She is prey for eagles, so she hunts at night. 
family and that will take us places we can never reach without you. Remember, we're entering the learning zone. Now, how can we show our respect to the children and teachers who are working? We can walk quietly. Yes. Okay, kids, so what I'd like you to do is continue writing your narrative, documenting your emotions if you were the baby owl and your mother abandoned you in the nest. What can you do? Learn all that you can so that you can challenge us to be our best. You would have stayed and assisted them in whatever they needed. Share yourself with us and show us how to share ourselves with others. Give us courage. Give us compassion. Help us find our own voices so we can become who we are meant to be. Why would you want to silence us? video is, I found it really powerful. If you want, put up your thumbs if you found it really powerful too. Um, and we've all been in the situation where we've seen parents come into our library, child care providers, and they don't smile once at their child. All they do is command their child to do things or yell at their child or shush their child. When I'm training early, when I'm training children's librarians, I tell them the most important part of your entire job is to smile at people. When someone walks into the children's room, a smile makes all the difference in the world. If people feel that you're not friendly to them, why would they want to come back? But if you smile at them and they feel that you like them, then they'll come back again. And once they keep coming, they'll really be able to make full use of all the library has to offer them. Unfortunately, not all childcare providers know about smiling. And it really makes such a difference. The atmosphere that we're in helps us focus, helps everything go on. Um, and so we want to impart this message to child care providers. I wonder if this video is something you might want to show during your training. And if it is, you know where to get it. You can find it on Cox Canvas. But you can't just show the video. You have to kind of put it into context. So my program, Mother Goose on the Loose, yeah, I developed this early literacy program called Mother Goose on the Loose. I forgot to say that at the beginning. Um, and it uses what I call developmental tips to give information to parents and caregivers in simple, understandable ways. Because when you have a story time, you get the adults as well as the children. And that's a great time to encourage the parents to use the five practices with their children. But the story time is for the kids, so we can't spend a lot of time addressing things to the parents. So we just want something short and simple to engage the adults and to let them know what we've done, why we've done it, and how they can do it at home. So the first thing to do is say what you did. So in this case, I might say, we just saw the every opportunity video. And then the second thing is to say what skill or activity that supports or reinforces. So you might say, it showed us the strong effect a smile and a friendly reception can have on a child's attitude towards learning. And you may want to add another sentence to that, like, even if you've had a bad day, the importance of a smile should never be underestimated. And then for the third part of the tip, you can describe how to replicate it. So for instance, you can say, so when children arrive at your daycare, even if you've had a rough day and it's only morning, be sure to welcome them with a big smile. It seems obvious, but a reminder never hurts. So you don't need to list all the benefits. Just one is enough. Short and sweet makes it easier to hear and remember. So let's see if we can create other developmental tips about what we've learned in this video. So do we want to put everybody in breakout rooms? And you're going to have, did we say 10 minutes or five minutes, Rebecca? Um, I think we decided that five minutes was not quite enough. Let's do eight. Eight minutes. Okay. So for fail. Okay. So let's go into our breakout rooms. And I just want to tell you that another reason these developmental tips are great is for childcare providers 
they are pushed now to do a lot with family engagement and a lot of them don't know what it means. And so these kind of simple tips, if you teach them how to do developmental tips, they can put them in their weekly newsletters. This is what we did this week. This is why it's important. This is how you can do it at home. They can post it on their bulletin boards. They can say it in person to parents during pickup or drop off. And so although the tips are small, if you create one tip a day, the caregivers, the parents, and the children will benefit. Okay, um, this is uh, introductions about the breakout rooms. The first thing I'd like you to do is just introduce yourself to the other people. And then I want you to go through the questions and see if you can find a developmental tip to go along with anything at all that we've learned in the webinar so far. And then choose one person to be your spokesperson um, to come back and share that tip with us and also write their name in the chat so I know who to call on. Okay, I'm gonna pause three. There we go, welcome back everyone. Okay, who, who would like to start by sharing their developmental tip? Caitlin? Sure, I'll go. Um, so we were talking about the alligator song um, and about the repetition and you know doing the voice modulation to make it more fun. And um, our developmental tip was that um, children learn- No, start from number one. I'll start from number one. Oh, today we did the alligator song um, and we did it, we repeated it over and over um, and children learn best through repetition. So we encourage you to do this song at home with them. Hey. <laughs> okay. okay, Shannon. So, Okay, um, we also were talking about repetition, but we were saying, um, you know, don't be, I guess I need to start over. Today, we read the same book that we read last week and repetition, don't be afraid of repetition if it's your child's favorite because it helps them to build confidence and it, um, they often will, once they learn the words and the motions, they build self-esteem. Um, it'll also set the mood so that if you have a situation where uh, people are not having the best day, pulling out their favorite book and using the repetition might calm the situation and put a happy face on everyone and it sets expectations of a different mood in the room. So we would encourage you to not shy away from repeating the same book over and over, but to use that as almost a reward system. Okay, so that was a packed chock full of nuts <laughs> developmental tip because you gave so many reasons. And here we're trying to be simple. So you could turn okay, that. Sorry. No, 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 don't be sorry. We had the same thing in our room. So, so it's all part of me explaining what I'm talking about. Imagine a childcare provider who has to send home a newsletter every single day. That's a lot of days. So one week you're gonna do, you're gonna focus on repetition. So you say on the first day, we read this book, blah, blah, blah. And you could just have something about reading books. The second day we read the book again and reading the same book builds self-confidence. And then the third day, we read the book again, and reading the book again, blah, 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 blah. And the fourth day, we read the book again, and blah, 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 blah. And then always the third thing is, believe it or not, you can read this book at home with your child and they'll enjoy it even more. And then you also give the tip about if you want them to calm down, like that is such a powerful tip of using a book that the child knows to help them calm down. But if you put it along with all the other things, it gets a little bit lost. So that could be a whole tip in its own. But so I'm saying you can use the same number one and number three. Today, we read this particular book. And number three, so read the book at home with your child. And number two, 
you have now five different developmental tips that you could that that sentence number two that you could stick in there. So you came up with great ideas. I think sometimes we make things harder for ourselves than we need to. <laughs> and and also when we're doing our story times, it makes the story times much richer for the parents if instead of going into a whole long thing about early literacy, we just give a short and simple tip. But if they come every single time and we give a short and simple tip every time, and I try to give two tips in the course of a story time, then they build up their knowledge and it makes it easy enough for them to remember and to do. Does anyone have any questions about that or shall we go back to the uh, back to the PowerPoint? Okay, let's go back to the PowerPoint. Thank you, though. Those were great examples. So over here, um, I mentioned to you that um, one of the other resources was the link that Rebecca had sent to you. And I just wanted to let you know that it's not very obvious. So if you go in this, um, in that toolkit, um, for the ready to read. If you go on the, um, I'm gonna, if you go on the table of contents and then you go to this page, scripts for childcare providers. If you click on this part right here where it says in blue presentation slide deck, ta -da! it will take you actually to the PowerPoints. Now this, this gives you an example again. Here is the toolkit. This is the link that Rebecca gave you. So I scroll down the toolkit and there's all this stuff for parent family workshops. And then I get to early childhood educators workshops and all I have to do is click on it and it will take me straight to the early, I don't have to scroll through the pages. You see what I did on the table of contents? And then if I click here on presentation slide deck, it will take me to the actual PowerPoint. And we have two, again, one is growing early literacy skills through songs and rhymes. And each one has actual notes underneath it of things that you can say. Um, it has a script under there, but you're asked not to use the word for word script that I created, but to actually change it and put it into your own words. They're all editable. And so it's written like this, but you can take out what you don't wanna use. You can take out slides, you can add slides in. If you don't like the book I chose, change a book. If you don't like the songs I chose, change a song. It's editable, but it gives you a basis for which to plan your um, your your workshop just at, oh, can you guys hear me? Could you hear me before? Okay. It, it gives you that basis for creating your workshop. So it takes the the hardest part of it out of the, out of this equation. Now, a lot of you are already ex delivering programs via Zoom. And if you're a participant on the webinar, it's fine to be without a headset. But do you see a difference between my speech from when I was wearing, where I'm wearing the headset and when I wasn't wearing it before? Yeah, I see Rebecca nodding her head. Using a headset makes the sound much clearer for everyone. And if you're interested, I just use a Logitech headset. You also want to test your lighting ahead of time, which is something I did with Rebecca. I wear glasses, so I try to find lighting that reduces the glare as much as possible. And you probably don't want a camera looking up your nose. If you have a laptop with a camera on the bottom of the screen, you might want to get a webcam. If you're using props, gather them together so you don't have to scramble for them while you're online. Like I keep this little frog puppet right next to me, so if I want to use him, I don't have to turn around and start looking. Many participants today have already presented Zoom programs, but if you think of more ideas, feel free to write them in the, um, in the chat. And I believe the best way to keep people engaged is to design interactive activities to make sure they do more than simply listening. And as you'll notice, I did that in this webinar. We had the annotate, we've had the polls, we've had people writing in the chat box, and we've had our um, breakout sessions. So those are all ways that you can, and we, we even had at the beginning where people were sharing with each other uh, what they loved about being a children's librarian. You will have the best results if you're comfortable with what you're saying and you convey it with warmth. If you practice ahead of time, you're familiar with the materials and then you're comfortable with it. Knowing all the words of the songs and rhymes is essential before you start. 
even if you need a cheat sheet or someone to remind you, and time yourself. If you think your presentation is too long, make it shorter, take out slides. No workshop should last more than two hours and an hour and a half is the best. When you're doing workshops in person at the library, highlight your materials. Do a display of the books that you have that they can borrow, of the cardboard books. Give a tour of the children's areas so they see that libraries aren't a place where people are shushed, but it's a place where they can feel comfortable playing. Describe any programs you have, whether you have kits, you know, books, a whole box of books to lend out, or maybe special library cards for childcare providers where they can keep the books for a month and there are no overdue fines. And most of all, smile and encourage them to return. So the general practices are, Engage your audience, clearly state why they're there, make sure it's a safe space. Don't control the whole thing, but facilitate it and allow people to contribute and share their knowledge. Have easy to read handouts, and I hope you'll find my handouts that you'll get at the end easy to read. And be sure to ask for feedback. And we have a survey at the end of this to do just that. Um, I guess we're not gonna have time for our elevator speech, but um, I will tell you about the elevator speech. Uh, in order to create relevant webinars or workshops for early childhood professionals, we need to be able to clearly explain who we are and what we have to offer in ways that emphasize the importance of early literacy. So an elevator speech is perfect for this. It's a short pitch like an advertisement that can be delivered in the time of an average elevator ride, about 30 to 45 seconds. Your goal for this speech is to highlight the value of the library in helping children build early literacy skills. It builds excitement and it gets buy-in from your audience. And so elevator speeches can be used to promote your workshops to early childhood educators too. It can explain why it's valuable for them to attend. Your wording for the elevator speech can also be used in your written materials. And if you've memorized your speech, you can use it wherever you are, whenever you're talking to anyone, anytime. So it's in four parts. The, who are you and what does your library do? So for example, hi, I'm Betsy from the Mother Goose and the Loose Library. I present weekly story times for babies, toddlers, and preschoolers where children have fun with rhymes, stories, and books. Number two, how does this directly benefit children? The fun story time activities build early literacy skills. Children also practice social, emotional, STEM, and motor skills through songs, finger plays, and book related activities. And it's all playful. How valuable is it in the long run? Building these skills now helps children do better in school later and leads to a greater ability to navigate through life. It often leads to lower rates of incarceration too. How can this information be used to promote your workshops? My upcoming training shares the why and how of early literacy programming, and it gives you tools to adapt story time activities into circle time and transition activities. Would you like to sign up? So basically, we're modifying the format of the developmental tip, short and sweet. Who you are is instead of this is what we did. Then we put the value piece in the middle. And then at the end, instead of saying why you should do the rhyme at home, it's why you should come to my training workshop. And it's important to have this speech ready so you can use it whenever the opportunity arises. You can use it while waiting in line at the supermarket when you're visiting schools or any time at all. If you want to convince child care providers that coming to your workshop is worthwhile, you need to be able to explain why what you have to offer them will be helpful. Not just what you have to offer them, but why it will be helpful. So we're not going to go into breakout rooms, but um, having an elevator speech is meant to give you confidence as an early literacy professional along with the ability to communicate what you're doing and why it's important. And would anyone here like to try to quickly do an early uh, a speech just at the top of their head? Does anyone feel confident to do that? If not, that's fine. OK, I don't see any raised hands, so. We'll save that, but, but please try to build one on your own at home. So I believe that librarians and especially children's librarians and the library are a force for change within the community for positive change. When I started the webinar, I gave a definition of early literacy as what children know about reading before they can actually read and write. 
It's about everything they do to build up the skills that enable them to read and write when their brains and bodies are ready for it. And some child care providers don't realize that. They think they need to use flashcards and they have to get these little kids to be learning how to write letters when their motor skills aren't ready and their brains aren't ready. So we are actually showing them how to use early literacy activities and play to build these skills. And children begin to learn their early literacy skills from the moment they're born through interactions with other people and the environment. The role you play is incredibly important because you see the children, you see their families, and you also can interact with their child care providers. You're helping to create the future of our country and our world. By working with the early childhood educators, you're helping children set the stage for future success in life. So I think you guys are heroes. And I want to applaud you and thank you again for coming to this webinar today um, for thinking it was important enough to come. And how to get to the child care providers is basically just go out there, find out and contact them. I think personal contact is the best by calling them, by talking to them when you see them, if you see someone out with a bunch of kids in the playground, um, those personal connections really make a difference. So thank you, you guys are all heroes. Do I have any questions? I, I have one. Sure. Okay, so are you trying to, would you try to invite several daycare workers to a workshop with you at the library? Or should you, knowing that, you know, their time is so precious, should you try to do a, a, a shortened version on their own terms on their, at their own location? I, I, um, I do think it's kind of hard sometimes to get the buy-in for additional time pulls, you know, so um, as much as I wouldn't want to do it, I, I guess I could provide the, the Zoom option. I but... think that if they had, I think that if it was something they did on their own time, that was not a scheduled time, but it was just like a, a video they could watch, they wouldn't watch it. Mm -hmm. It really is about them feeling connected to you. And if they like you, you take an interest in them, you smile at them, you ask them what they're doing. And then you say, you know what? I'm doing this workshop. I'd really love it if you came. You can even say it's my first time doing workshops for child care providers and I'd love your feedback. Um, they will probably come. And if, you know, the ideal thing I think would be in the library because then you give them a tour for the library. If you have a budget for okay. snacks, have some snacks, but you can also send them home with things. You can get, you know, brochures from other community services. You can give it to them. Uh, you might have books you want to give away. Uh, so if you could give them something also so that they feel that it's worthwhile. And uh, one of the webinars I have actually talks about making flannel boards out of pizza boxes. And if they're on site, they can actually make a flannel board out of a pizza box while they're there and then take it back with them. So, you know, but, but just a written flyer or an announcement on a listserv doesn't do it. So that's why it's great if you can find places and call them or go to them and just talk personally to get their buy-in. And of course, in these days of COVID, we can't always get people to come to our place. So in that case, webinars, but I think also we want people to interact with each other. We want to create that sense of community. Like today, it was great. We had the breakout rooms. And even though some people could only write on chat, don't you feel comfortable with the people we're all here with now? It's a really nice feeling. So we want to bring them together. Okay. Thank you. My pleasure. Any other questions? I'm going to go ahead and stop the recording. Wait, I think we should do alligator alligator one more time, don't you? <laughs> oh, you can stop the you can stop the recording if you want. That's fine. Everyone take out your alligator.